those who have given the ultimate sacrifice, whether it be in military or in the service of our country in some other form, whether it be uh, police or fire service or what other way um, we can think of, uh, we just want to take time to remember them. So let's just pause with a, a moment of silence for those that we remember today who did not come home from their tour of service or duty. Amen. Good morning. Today, later today, I will be embarking on a trial run uh, of a trip that I'm going to be taking in September. Amy left for a long weekend yesterday morning to go visit with the grandbabies, and, and she is in happy grandma land right now, uh, spending time with uh, Emery and Odin and Ashton and James, uh, side benefit of her mom and dad uh, deciding to go and see uh, the, the kids this weekend. So Amy got a hitchhike along with them and, and get to go with them. So I'm glad she's there. But so I and two other ministers will be leaving this afternoon on a uh, three-day, two-night hiking trip down around Bloomington, Indiana. Um, we're going to uh, have this excursion that's going to be kind of a practice run for a trip that I'm going to be taking with nine other ministers when we go up to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in September and hike along Lake Superior and like camp out like really camping out. Not glamping like some folks do, but we are going to be literally roughing it. And it's a combination spiritual retreat, but it's also kind of a physical challenge. And I've been working on preparing myself for that over the last several months. And part of that preparation is to go on this short trip uh, this weekend to try to prepare myself so I don't mess something up and do something stupid that's going to get myself or somebody else hurt and uh, cause the trip to be cut short. You know, when we get ready to go into the community to share the gospel, we have to do the same thing. We have to prepare ourselves and ready ourselves because when we begin to rise up, that's when the attacks will come. Amen. And so we have to be ready to suit up, as we're going to talk about from Ephesians chapter 6 today. We're going to talk about that armor of God that Paul discusses in that text. So you can go ahead and turn your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to get into that in just a moment. Hold that place for just a minute. As I was studying... For today's message from Ephesians 6, I could not help but think about my son-in-law, James, who served two tours of duty in the Marines, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan, and has rec recently retired from the military and began his civilian life. Um, I think of him because he too had to wear armor where he was, uh, where he was at, a real kind of armor, not the figurative kind like Paul's talking about, but the real kind of armor, and he had to wear it every day or take the chance of being taken out. He lived for the better part of two years in hostile lands where the people there wanted to take out as many U.S. soldiers as possible. They do so through regular small arms attacks and suicide bombings and those tricky, hard to find IEDs that they place along the roadside. And they wait for the soldiers to travel through and then terrible things happen. All these threats kept the Marines and other soldiers at a high alert, ready for attack. And they were trained to use their tools of the trade, the armor to defend themselves and in turn defend a nation and its interests. Here's a picture of James in country. Uh, he's the one that's closest to the camera there standing in that formation. He's on patrol. This is in Iraq. And you will notice that he wears heavy boots and he wears a belt and a vest that contains extra gear and tools. He has a flak vest to protect him against uh, shrapnel. He carries a rifle and he also wears a helmet made of Kevlar. Now all these parts and pieces might seem like an offensive type of display, but when you think about it, all of these tools that a soldier carries and wears are for defense. They're to protect them from things that might come and harm them. And this is why Paul used the armor of his time to describe what it means to live in Christ, to be prepared in Christ. We are on defense, trying to ward off the attacks of Satan. In today's passage, Paul's finishing up his letter to the Ephesians and is encouraging them to stand up to Satan, to rise up 
to the powers that go against those who believe in Christ. And he repeats this word in the Greek language, sthenai, S-T-H-N-A-I, if you spell it out in English, sthenai, which means to stand, to stand up, to rise up. And he uses various forms of this word throughout the passage. Four times, in fact, he uses a form of this same root word to get the people to understand the gravity of the attacks that were coming their way. And to encourage them to stand up under those attacks. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 10 and read through verse 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand at your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Now, Paul is saying a lot here, but his main point is essentially, church, rise up, suit up. It's time to make your stand. And this is not an attack of aggression or an offensive maneuver. We're not going out as an army per se to attack. But we are going out with the mindset of being in defense mode, looking for Satan's attack to come. Paul is saying get prepared and get ready to withstand the many attacks that are coming. It's a call to defend ourselves. You know, when we head out into the community around us to share the gospel, when a church begins to rise up, there's going to be an attack. You believe that this morning? Good, because if you don't, you're fooling yourself. When a church starts moving as God is calling them to move, then the attacks will come. And we must be prepared and ready to defend ourselves. So how do we stand up against Satan's attacks? Well, first Paul says to stand for truth. He talks about this truth belt that's part of the armor. And I love that old John Cougar Mellencamp song, Stand for Something. The lyrics of the chorus repeat that old proverb from Scripture. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. To suit up, to take the stand for Christ against Satan, we have to know and believe in the truth. What is the truth? It comes from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and there is no other way to the Father except through Him. That is truth. God's truth is unwavering. It's the same today as it was yesterday. It'll be the same in the future. We must know what we believe so that when the attacks come, we can stand against them. Paul also says we need to live right. He talks about that breastplate of righteousness. What does a breastplate protect? Your heart, right? The heart of a human body pumps the blood, which forms the muscles, which gives us our strength. And Paul talks about protecting that part of ourselves. Everyone remember Live Strong? Remember that that, uh, whole movement that went on with Lance Armstrong, the famous cyclist? He became a, a, a kind of a poster boy for cancer. He became this moniker of an organization to fight against all kinds of cancers, this Live Strong movement. And unfortunately, that name has been kind of sullied a little bit with his admitted use of drugs to enhance his abilities to heal quicker. 
And many people wore the wristbands and the t-shirts with Live Strong on them. And what I would rather see Christians wear, kind of t-shirts and bracelets and things that we would wear, instead of saying Live Strong on them, I think it would be important for us to wear things that say Live Right. Live Right. Living right is not high on very many people's priority list these days. I think if most people were honest, if I were to ask them, their t-shirts might say live for me or live convenient rather than live right. In this get-ahead society that we live in, oftentimes right is sacrificed for personal gain. Let's buck the system. Let's be different than the norm. As Christians, we are called to live right. So let's be a congregation that lives right. Amen. Thirdly, he says, be ready. Be ready. He says, be, have feet that are fitted with readiness. I don't know what kind of shoes he's talking about there, but they must have been really fast shoes. <laughs> Being ready is a key to responding to problems or crisis. The attacks of Satan usually come at the most inopportune times for us, right? They come in moments of weakness. They come in moments when we are already stressed out and stretched to our limits. They come in moments when we have our guard down because we're in a good moment of time in the church. Right? Isn't that when we usually let our guard down a little bit? Things are going well. Things are progressing. We're making a difference. We're getting out in the community. And we let our guard down. And that's when Satan comes to get us. Paul is saying, be vigilant. We must be ready. I read a really interesting story about T.Y. Hilton at, his, at the time of this story. It was in Sports Illustrated a few years ago. At the time, he was in his second year as a wide receiver for the Colts. And in the article, Hilton, who is a Christian, by the way, um, talks about how he was preparing for that upcoming season. And T.Y. had broken a few rookie records in receiving in his first year and was near the top in all the receiving categories by the, end of the season, by the end of the season. But he was not going to rest on that previous year's accomplishments. He knew what happens in the season is just the fruits of preparing in the off season. They would never be able to react and respond the way they do during the regular season games if it were not for all the extra work they put in in the off season at mini camps and training camps and workouts. He said that he and Reggie Wayne and Andrew Luck spent time solidifying his skill sets and increasing his knowledge. And he kept looking to Wayne to mentor him and, and help him grow as an athlete in his second season. In the same way, we need to be prepared for what is coming for us. We need to be able to withstand the attacks. We can't just show up during the regular season and expect to perform well. We have to be prepared. As, a, as we prepare for each new excursion into the community around us, we need to get ready. We need to disciple each other. We need to spend time mentoring each other. And as I look across this congregation, there are probably thousands of years of experience in Christ sitting in this room. And as we go into second service later on today, there are going to be another hundred people or so that are going to be sitting in this room who don't have that experience who don't have that knowledge, who don't know how to defend themselves. And what I'm saying is, and what we're hoping for as we move into the future, is that folks from this service will take it upon themselves to mentor our folks in our second worship service. To watch after them, to lead them, to, to help them grow. To help them prepare for the battles that are going to come. We should always be readying ourselves for what could come in the way of spiritual attacks. Satan pays no attention to the sleepwalking churches that we talked about last week. Remember we talked about how some churches are sleepwalking and they're just kind of going through the motions and they're not really waking up, they're not really alive. Satan doesn't pay attention to those churches. But when a church starts rising up, you better believe it gets his attention. And that's when he attacks. Paul gives Timothy a uh, similar instruction in 2 Timothy 4.2. He says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. What Paul is trying to say here is that we can't wait for trouble to come. We have to be ready and prepared so that when trouble comes, we're ready to respond. 
Next, he says we need to have faith. He talks about the shield of faith. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Either you have faith or you don't. It's that simple. You have to have faith to fight off Satan, folks. If you don't believe in Christ, if you really don't believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, if you really don't believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, if you really don't believe in God's providence and unyielding power and love, you have no chance against Satan's attacks. No chance. That's why we hear all the time about people's faith being shaken. Or that their faith is wavering. It's because Satan knows that is the best way to take you out. Is to beat up your faith. It reminds me of the Star Trek universe. I'm going to expose my nerdiness here a little bit. In the Star Trek universe, I love all those shows and TV shows and movies and all that stuff. But you'll never watch an episode or a movie of Star Trek where somebody during the movie says, raise the shields, right? Because they're being attacked. And the crew of the Enterprise or any of the other ships from the franchise trust in their shields. They know that if their shields fail, their ship will be destroyed. They work hard at preparing and maintaining the shields. And when the shields are damaged, what do they do? They take power from weapons, and they take power from life support, and they take power from all the other parts of the ship, and they strengthen the shields, right? So I'm telling all of you this morning, Christians, raise your shields. Turn those things on. Make them stronger. Build them up so that you will be ready. Keep your faith up and exercise your faith daily. Look for God in all situations and take joy in his provision and his care. It is in our faith that our souls find salvation and protection. Which leads us to Paul's next statement, which was seek salvation. He talks about the helmet of salvation. To get, a place, to, get to a place where we can defend ourselves, we must first be saved. That helmet is an instrument of protection for the head. And where does Satan most often attack? Our minds, right? He's always going after our minds. Remember what Jesus said, that when we think about killing someone, that's murder. When we think about someone inappropriately that's not our spouse, that's adultery. When we think about ourselves first, we have committed idolatry, which we talked about last week. You get the idea. The mind. It's not a terrible thing to waste. The mind is just a terrible thing at some points, right? Because it just lets everything in. And that's where we have some trouble. So Paul talks about protecting our heads. If we can keep the idea of our salvation and our thankfulness for what Jesus did to save us at the front of our minds, it's like we're wearing this helmet that protects our minds from sin and Satan's attacks. Then he says we are to know his word. He talks about the sword of the Spirit. The way we build ourselves up in this area of right thinking and strength in our salvation is to know God's Word. Not just read it. Not just keep a copy of it on our bookshelf or our nightstand, but know it. When was the last time you memorized Scripture? When I was five, you know? When we were little kids, right? A lot of us, it's the last time we really memorized Scripture. Maybe some of you were part of the women's Scripture memory group that, that met last year. And if you were part of that, kudos to you. And you're ahead of a lot of us in that. And we encourage you to keep doing that. When was the last time that someone asked you where a verse was in Scripture and you were able to take them directly to it? Oh, I know where that's at. Let me show you. <laughs> Spending time in God's Word for the specific purpose of memorization and not just for repeating it, but for knowing it is something we all need to do. Myself included. I need to improve in this area as well. We need to be able to draw from Scripture and use it in everyday living so that right decisions are made and proper actions are taken in every situation, especially those situations when we are under attack. What did Jesus do when Satan attacked him in the desert? 
He fired back scripture at him, didn't he? Because he knew it. He knew it. We're going to begin a new sermon series starting next week called Remember the Words. And we will be doing this eight-week uh, series with eight standalone sermons that are going to be looking at different scripture verses that we should memorize that will help us be able to share the main truths of God's Word. And I hope that you will join us as we discuss each one of those each week, the context around those verses that we're going to look at. And we're going to also give you different tools each week to help you memorize Scripture. We're not just going to say, memorize Scripture, figure it out. We're going to also give you some ways that will help you, little tricks of the trade in memorization. These are things that like actors and different people who have to memorize a lot of words. We're going to help you with some tools to be able to memorize Scripture on your own. I think it's going to be an awesome eight weeks to get us through the summer. And the cool thing is, is if you miss a week, for whatever reason, you're not, going to, you're not going to be lost in the series because each sermon is going to stand alone. So be with us. Watch us online if you miss one. It's going to be awesome. You see, knowing God's Word will amplify your ability to handle anything that comes your way. You may not always be able to avoid every hit that comes, but you will be far better prepared to deal with those hits when they do come if you know God's Word. Because if you know God's Word, you know God. To be able to really fight off Satan's attack, our main point this morning is simple. To be able to rise up, we have to be prepared to fend off spiritual attacks. We have to be ready to go. We have to suit up. We have to stand for truth. We have to live righteously. We have to be ready. We have to have faith and hold on to our salvation. We have to know his word. And then Paul says we also need to stay alert and continue to pray. The once proud organization, the Boy Scouts of America, which no longer is that, um, had a motto that simply said, be prepared. And that idea is very important in our ability to fend off spiritual attacks. Paul says, be alert. He says, look for the attacks. Now, I don't want you to be paranoid. I don't want us to become paranoid Christians that are looking for Satan under every rock. But I want you to be looking for Satan under every rock. Does that make sense? I don't want you to be like constantly like, well, where's Satan at? But I mean, we need to be watching for him. We need to be watching for the attacks. Because he's sneaky. Sometimes the stuff he throws at us looks good. Sometimes he, the things he uses are things that are good things in normal everyday life. But they are meant to trip us up. 1 Peter 5.8 says this, Be alert and sober of mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. It's a strong word there. Not someone just to knock down on their rear ends. Not looking for someone to, to cause problems, to devour, to kill. What I ha hope does not happen in September if a bear comes along up in the northern peninsula of Michigan. Sorry, a little segue into that a little bit. Um, but we have to be alert. We have to keep our minds sharp. And then secondly, he says, keep praying. Pray against the attacks, he says. Be prepared. How do we prepare? We hit our knees and we pray. And we pray, and we pray, and we pray some more, and then we pray some more. In verse 18 he says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Amen. We need to not only pray for ourselves, we need to not only pray for the church, little C, Brady Lane Church, but we need to pray for the big C too. The churches work all over the world. We need to be praying for all the Lord's people. And I love how Paul finishes up this part of the letter. The last two verses, 1920 says, Pray also for me that whenever I speak, the words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Even Paul, the great Paul, right? Even Paul had those times where he felt weaker and didn't feel like he could really, he's asking for the church to pray for him that he would be bold, that he'd be strong. And I'm going to ask you to pray for our staff and leadership as we are praying for you. 
Because we need your prayers as much as Paul pleaded for it from the Ephesians. We need your prayers. Because if Satan can take out the leadership, he will take out the church. Right? And you all know what I'm talking about because we've seen it. We know what it looks like. So pray for us that we will be fearless. Pray for us as we're heading into an awesome summer of all kinds of excitement, community events, VBS, camp, planning for the future. And through it all, we need to be fearlessly making known the gospel of Jesus Christ, our purpose, our mission, right? That we've been talking about through this whole eight weeks. We need to be on point. God is calling Brady Lane Church to rise up. This is my locker room speech time. We're going to rise up. We're going to rise up and we're going to be counted amongst the kingdom workers of heaven. And to rise up, we have to remember that we have been chosen for this purpose, for this mission. That we are alive in Christ for this mission, for this purpose. That we are called as a church to carry this purpose out, to carry the gospel and reach out to lost people. And to be able to do that, we have to be one. We have to be unified. We can't all be going off in a hundred different directions. We have to be focused, laser focused on the goal, on the mission, on the purpose. And we have to shine that light. When we get out into the community, we have to shine it brightly, which means we have to live it out. So that we can bring more people into our family. So let's wake up. Let's suit up. Let's rise up. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you today. And I'm relying on you and your Holy Spirit. To take these words that you've given me and press them into the hearts of these people. Because I can say these words and I, can, and I can believe it myself and I can follow through with it myself. But if we as a church don't rise up, if we as a church don't prepare ourselves, if we as a church don't commit ourselves to this purpose, the church will fall. The church is always one generation away from going away. We have to pass on what we know, what we believe, how to do it to the next generation. So Father, continue to embolden us, continue to put passion in our hearts for what you have for us to do. Let us put all the other foolishness aside. Let us forget about all the other junk that comes along with religion and focus on a faith that has a mission and a goal and a purpose. Father, I thank you for being an awesome God, for having a plan and making that plan so simple have faith in my son, you said. Believe in his death, burial, and resurrection, you said. And in that you will have my grace, he said. Father, we thank you for that grace today. We praise you, we worship you, we honor you, we remember you. In Jesus' name, amen.